I thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm sorry that I missed the first part of the discussion. I'm sure it was really interesting. So thank you, Margo, for having me. I put together something for you that I hope is going to be useful about somehow some of my work. And I guess you will see why I've chosen to assemble them like that. Then I can just add perhaps to start a few more words about me. So I'm an architect, an urban designer, an educator, and an activist. And you will see that those are facets of my work that are very much interrelated, all propelled by a sense of urgency in regard to the state of our world. I define my work as the critical practice of urban design, meaning I merge practice, research, and teaching interest. And I also explore new ways to understand the conditions of the built environment, as well as new formats to communicate these findings and potentially discuss design intervention. So what you will see is also part of an ongoing research. And I also want to offer some provocation for discussion, and I hope you will pick up on that. So I chose as a title from Food to Materials, the Political Economy of Commodities and its Discontent. I locate this conversation in a larger approach in my work, which is about articulating a critique of architecture and planning as disciplines that claim innocence, yet somehow capital accumulation and what we know as the corresponding brutal and destructive processes at work in the transfer of raw materials to the built environment, but also the role of the profession in the design of injustice and oppression down to the exploitative ways that the profession itself operates on exhaustion and unpaid labor, speak for the urgency to reform design from conceptual processes to the office. I hope to address the role of design in the production of space to question the role of designers within market-driven logics. And I attempt to equip who wants to, with the tools to resist against these mechanisms of brutal urbanization that have led to untenable situation of spatial and social injustice everywhere. I also hope to articulate a framework for a climate aware, ethical, social and political practice of urban design toward responsible planning approaches, both preemptive and reactive of contemporary situations. So my work revolved around four themes, which you see here on the left, resources, governance, economy and ecology, in this kind of research framework grounding in the political economy of space in general and on commodities and their effect on the built environment in particular. I also try to act, react, and seek some answers to how urban design can respond to today's urgency. So my work and the work of my students, of course, are somehow channeled into what I have defined as this strategic practice of urban design, a term that is borrowed from environmental philosopher Freya Matthews. As she points at the need for new and interconnected forms of action in the time of the Anthropocene, a term we also need to interrogate. So the outputs of the work was basically the right uh, column takes uh, as many forms as necessary, really, uh, always advocating for a performative, engaged, innovative, collaborative, and hopeful urban design for an uncertain future. And I will pick a few of those. You will see how they appear and become part of the project as formats and see how they somehow inform this practice. Starting with what Margot actually mentioned, many of these themes and topics, so the focus on resources, ecology, economy, and governance are grounded in my dissertation that I completed in 2018 entitled Food Territories, the political economy of food systems and its effects on the built environment. I'm looking at Egypt in particular, which is in the excruciating publication process at the moment. It's a work that aims to identify how commodities in this case, very specifically looking at grain, wheat in particular, how that actually affects the built environment from an architectural, urban and territorial point of view and to highlight the mechanisms producing and shaping space. And this is to say that Somehow this understanding of space grounded in political economy is very formative. It has shaped my further research pedagogy and what you will see in this ongoing works. Do you have sound, Margot? I think if you, when you share screen, there's an option at the lower left-hand corner that says share with sound. Yeah, I did that, but I was just wondering if from your end you will have some sound. I hope so. Okay. We'll try. Otherwise, it's okay. also no big deal. It's fine. So maybe just to give a bit of context and background as to why and how this topic uh, was defined and chosen. In 2011, global food prices went up and a street food seller set himself in fire in a rural town of Tunisia, initiating what was to become the Tunisian Revolution, which led to the fall of Ben Ali, the ruler, 
and was followed by demonstration across the Middle East in autocracies of bread, Yemen, Morocco, Bahrain, Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. And you see somehow the way that bread appears in these images as a kind of symbol of what you could refer to as a kind of social contract. So while these demonstrations were originally generated by high food prices, included demands for democracy, social justice, and freedom, basically broader social and political issues than just the cost of basic necessities and resulted in very important political shifts. Millions of Egyptians came down to the streets in nationwide protests. This uprising defies any definitions. People are gathering in the largest demonstrations against President Hosni Mubarak. So these events, the kind of this Brett riot uh, of the Arab Spring can be considered as the initiating spark of this research, offering a point of departure by linking high food prices and global economy to local forms of urbanization and political dissent, prompting questions that form the very body of this work. So a few notes on the dissertation itself. I will not dive too much into it, don't worry, but it's organized in three parts, somehow grounded in an interdisciplinary scope. It uses scale as a unifying structural framework and functions a little bit like a, an hourglass from global to local to global. But the first part on the political economy of food systems speaks about why food is relevant, what are food systems, and somehow narrows down the topic to grain, wheat, and bread. It reconstructs the global flow of wheat and identifies the key agents at the global level concluding with connections between the global grain chain and its spatial organization at the geographical scale, somehow aiming at understanding what are the driving forces of the food system globally, how they operate, and what are their material expression. The second part, which is actually the biggest, and I wish that someone would have told me that I didn't need to write 600 pages, focuses on Egypt and the concrete current spatial transformation with these three case studies. They are, each of them corresponds to a scale of spatial transformation, architectural, urban, and territorial, and they each investigate a different substructure of the food system. One is about food subsidies, the second one's about food production, and the third one is about food security with these three sites, Alexandria, Cairo, and Toshka. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that somehow a lot of work has been done through fieldwork observation, very useful work to do diagrams, drawing and mappings, using also architectural representation tools, of course, primary and secondary literature, archive, archive and media material mostly. And the aim of this section was to formulate how food system processes impact the built form in particular territories. And I will show you one particular example afterward. The third part, Food territory is the conclusion. It's really the part where you sit and you think, why am I doing this? I'm kidding, but it's the most, it's the part where we really wanted to highlight how the effects of the political economy of food on the built environment offer finding and petition, potential directions for further reflections. And here I was looking into territorial reciprocity, the idea that space is not just a kind of flat ground for forces to be imposed on it, but is actually through various forms of agency able to actually act upon other effects. And I will also talk a little bit about it. Maybe briefly to establish what is a political economy of food systems, I used Harriet Friedman's concept of food regimes or food orders, a very useful, a very useful work from her perspective. Rich countries have led poor nations into dependency and debt and rule the present world food system. She argues that years of heavy debt services structural adjustment programs, market integration, food aid, and the influence of the World Bank of the IMF have intensified the current dependence of developing countries, developing countries on cheap food imports, something that is illustrated by this map of trade flows of durum wheat, which is one of the most traded form of wheat. And you can see that the top importing countries were the one experiencing the food riots I mentioned earlier. And somehow the notion of political economy of food serves to illuminate these processes of exploitation and to question the spatial relations between the global grain trade and local territorial organization. To analyze in detail the grain chain, I used a method that is borrowed from sociology called the global commodity chain analysis. I quote, networks of labor and production processes whose end result is a finished community commodity linking households, enterprises, and states to one another within the world economy. So I identified and mapped the material flows of grain into sectors and agents from input, we're talking about seed and fertilizers, industry, production, farmers and agribusinesses, transportation companies, rail, sea, roads, processing, milling and food industry, as well as bakers, distribution agents, supermarket chains, food stores, and food aid networks, 
and then consumption agents, basically humanity, and somehow involved at all levels, financial trading and institutional agents, banks, traders, policymakers, and states. From there, I uncovered the driving forces involved in the grain chain globally, from, say, input agents involved in seed production, Monsanto, but let's say buyer to production agents, which is the least capitalized segment so far, so with small, medium, and large farming structures, to trading companies such as Cargill or Glencore, transportation firms like Clarkson, to processing industry actors such as familiar names, Barilla, and other distribution agents, and Nest2, defining who are the major wheat consumption nations, it's very small, but in dark blue, you see the Middle East region. And finally, the financial and institutional agents, hedge funds such as BlackRock, but also World Trade Organization. So in a way, it's a kind of a snapshot. And this one dates from 2018. So there, things have changed a little, but it's surprisingly stable. A snapshot of the major agents shows who is behind our food system in terms of capital volumes and power, and I think delivers a clear image of this political economy of food that Friedman articulated. I then set into identifying how these agents in turn affect space and looked at their spatial production as well as their geographical position. So diagram, of course, only materialized some as the essence in a way. So it's a sort of inventory of the spaces that correspond to the grain chain agents and actions, the infrastructure of the grain chain from say greenhouses for seeding to areas of production, farms and silos to transportation infrastructure. We're talking harbors, docks, warehouses, grain elevators, but also maritime sea routes and ships to the processing industry, mills, for instance, and factories to distribution spaces like shops and bakeries to the consumption space, cities and homes. And of course, the spaces, again, generated by more abstract economic activities, such as research centers, irrigation infrastructure, factories, stock exchanges, and other industrial buildings. So in a way, I hope that this catalog helped to establish this correlation between grain flows, global economy, and space production. This analysis also allows to establish the dependency of Egypt, in particular as a case study, also shown on this map with the flows of imported wheat, and how in correlation with the urban riots, the country established a paradigmatic paradigmatic case study to look at the spatial implications of the political economy. So one of the key segments pertaining to the spatial impacts of the political economy of food is in fact the question around food production, urbanization, and agrarian land. And I will maybe show you a bit into detail the case of Cairo, looking at the competition for land use between agriculture and urbanization. And one of the main features of Egypt's geography is the scarcity of agrarian land, which you see in gray on that map, which is referred to as the old lands. And the mode of spatial production at work here is the transformation of this old lands, fertile old lands, into self-built urbanized area, which is on the right side. And somehow this underlines the land competition for two of the most basic human needs, food and shelter. And looking at this precarious imbalance, between urban growth and agricultural land epitomizes the tensions between urban dynamics and environmental concern with regard to local food supply and sustainable urban. Now, what you see here is an illegal construction incrementally built over agrarian land. It is representative of the physical fabric generated by self-built housing production. When we talk about self-build, we mean somebody, usually this is linked to remittances, so it's somebody working abroad, securing capital, putting together a team to actually source and source materials. Okay, first buy the plot, which is actually an agrarian plot and is not able, not let's say, which is an illegal construction. It's not legal to build on agrarian land. And you see in the background of this image, a residue of agricultural fields. So once the plot is secured and people would build this kind of structure, it's incremental in the sense that if there is enough money to buy to to build a ground floor and one floor that's already very good and then whenever the needs occurs an extra floor would be added for instance when one of the family's son get married and so on that's why using the term both self-built which is very acute accurate i believe and then also incremental in the sense that it is something that happens across several years now here's the cadastral map east, the traditional city of Cairo. It's the area of Mohandesin, which was built around 1970. And you can see that there is a train line and you can see at the bottom how urbanization starts to creep in at the limits of the city on agrarian land along Fedans, which are these very 
thin longitudinal fields, which are very recognizable on the map. This is for irrigation reason. I remind you that this is the Nile Valley. So we're looking at pre-1970 floodable plains. So the, the area would basically flood and this kind of irrigation systems are also for drainage reasons. Now, this is the area today. So despite its importance for local food security, what is disappearing arable lands under these destructive forces of urbanization. And it's a restructuration of territory that emerged with a completely new urban form that somehow mirrors the former property limits of the fields. Again, I go back and you can see how it's following this. The process of construction of growth, I mentioned this term fedans, which you can see on the upper part of the slides. It's very long. This is an abstract form, but it's, it's a kind of longitudinal field. The fedans are actually often subdivided in smaller units, which you perhaps can decipher as this kind of square or semi-rectangular shapes, which are called kira, which are actually about agrarian practices. People would plant several different species of crops. So the owners of this plot would actually see, sell pieces of the land based on this curate system. So they would only sell small plot and what you like some construction appears. Of course, what it means is that the canals that are actually leading to this particular plot are filled to create access roads. Buildings will multiply and start to affect agrarian practices. The land price also go up and agriculture become less profitable. Irrigation is a problem, shade and also trash. Tenants would be evicted in some cases. This is because after Hosni Mubarak, uh, there was a cancellation of rent protection for farmers that were instituted by Nasser, which means that Overnight, the rent of the plots could go, could triple, which means tenants couldn't pay and would get evicted. This means that the entire Fedan can be constructed and the area is urbanized. The typical architecture, I was showing this image earlier, generated by this process is always the same. So it's built on small plots of about 12 by 14 meter. It's blind on three facades because you're always expecting someone to build right, left, and behind. The occupancy of the plot is full, except perhaps for 2.5 meters for the street. You leave a recess for the street and you can't deliver. It's always a concrete structure and a brick infill kind of construction. And the distribution is usually around a central staircase with three ventilation shafts or less or more. This is a more varied option. But somehow it's a typology that is repeated with a very few variations all over agrarian lands. So it's in a way important to signal that this unit is not to be understood as a single architectural entity, but it's the very fabric of the city. It's an endlessly repeated type. So again, here on the left, the typical small scale incrementally built perhaps one floor per year, is actually now complemented by what you see on the right side, which is actually a one-off 15-story tower, as more speculative modes of construction have emerged. Both uh, buildings, however, tell the tale of the destruction of local agriculture by self-organizing or semi-former groups who are building much-needed affordable housing, albeit illegally. The reputation of these types, along with the field form, mentioned previously is generating a kind of longitudinal street type, which some refer to as an urban canyon. Basically, you can see the forms, these kind of longitudinal strips appearing on the streetscapes here and the kind of recess situation with this kind of thin distance between the buildings as the building go up. This is prevalent. Some 12 million inhabitants, we're talking about 60% of the population living in Cairo live in areas of this type. Of course, it's a self-built urbanism that is not without problems, as these neighborhoods are completely underserviced and ignored by the authorities. In fact, the food riots that I mentioned earlier, the demonstration that was challenging the regime in 2011, originated a few streets away, linking food riots and urban discontents to spatial production. So these are political, nutritional, social uncertainties directly linked to spatial production. Is there a way that somehow we as designers can address this urgency? One, one project that I want to show you is somehow an attempt to respond to these mechanisms of space production with, it's a work that has been done in collaboration with local designers, local inhabitants and local students. And I want to show you two urban design schemes that were developed in the studio that I was teaching at ETH Zurich for the area of Ardileva, which is the one that you see here. Maybe one word about that picture. You might see, I don't know how good is your screen here, but basically there is a way to 
see the expansion. When the brick is very red, it means it's new. So what you can see is that you can see extensions. You can see when people have added one floor. And you can also see in the back the kind of this one-off towers, which are much brighter than the others, meaning they've been built actually very fast because the brick is the same. So that's just a kind of optic datation. So the project I want to show you is called Urban Seeds. It departs from the, let's say, diagnosis that there would be ways to increase the value of agrarian land. It's tech, it attempts to tackle this disappearance of agrarian land with the idea that you can actually implement sort of urban design scheme that is relying on the increased value of crop and a piece of architecture somehow. So the idea that this, if you have one small center for the production chain of valuable herbs cultivated locally, you can then increase revenue from yields and consequently the value of farmland. So these kind of production units for planting, drying, processing, packaging, and selling high value herbs, providing work to locals and a continuous income for the producers, and as well as a reliable supply for customers all in one building. So the idea is that you have this kind of center and in a way you help increase the value. The goal of the project is to reestablish a kind of complete agricultural cycle from seed to sales to engage and serve residents and advocate for the maintenance of productive agrarian land. Over time, the project shall be replicated in the surrounding areas, enhancing the value of residual farmland and battle against its disappearance. The second project I want to show you is called Solidary City. It embraces solidarity within the design process to produce a resilient, socially inclusive and sustainable building pool, building block by pooling neighborhood resources. What you on the left side is basically the current modus operandi, the one care type with, let's say, two very separate entities. The idea is to consider the close ties that already exist among the residents of this neighborhood to convert this social solidarity into a spatial reality. If financial and spatial resources are pooled, construction can be rationalized instead of the current single unit, the kind of back-to-back -back typology that you see on the left, the project proposed the joint construction of two combined units on two plots, new typology that then offers one single staircase for two units. Instead of a second staircase, there's a courtyard that's created, improving ventilation and lighting. New housing types with common kitchens envisioning a semi-communal way of living with the courtyard as the core of the building shall function as a semi-public space around which the common rooms of the flats are oriented. And somehow this staircase offers increasing levels of privacy from ground floor to the rooftop. The scheme suggests to push further the existing solidarity network and collaborative effort for an improvement of current housing modes. Maybe one word about the relevance of this particular work and the outputs and something I would like to link to this idea of strategic practice is that the work, so that kind of work has been exhibited internationally and locally, but because the goal was to work against the negative perception attached to these areas and for stronger engagements of architects in these neighborhoods. There's a, a, an exhibition here at the heart of the area. We use the term construction fair with the idea of inviting contractors and local construction actors and some of our partners to see this project and to also have the option to take away the floor plans because that's also how such plans circulate among construction actors. The idea is also to make through this exhibition urban and territorial design legible and making it a public matter accessible to all. So these are, for instance, one of the one of the floor plan that was circulated in this in this show. Now the research and the projects are also published in Housing Cairo, which calls for a reassessment in the way that planning disciplines react to forces of urbanization. So this is actually not my dissertation, but it's a spin-off of my dissertation. So with this part concluding, I want to move into questions and urgencies around resources and material ecologies. And you will see that somehow this is also connected to the first part of what I was just talking about. It's very much grounded in the same sort of methodology. And this work aims to bridge the distance between sites of extraction, production, and consumption to materials. So it's an approach that's grounded in the belief that there's no such thing as neutrality of design and that the global enterprise of extraction spans across all scales and architecture is just one of those scales. There could be several hidden or not so hidden agenda in this research, thinking about the care and the maintenance of the earth as one, but also a critique to the lack of accountability of designers, questioning the human stewardship of our resources, but also potentially repositioning design disciplines in a new ontology of material extraction and so on and so forth. It's part of a research that's actually called Architecture of Exhaustion, Space and the Political Economy of Construction Materials. 
mineral worth, wealth and resource extraction. In that teaching unit, we actually aim to identify construction material commodity chains and their relation to the built environment, to establish a critical methodology and a research design exploration around this political economy of construction materials and of the built environment at large. I'm going to show you the trailer, a piece of the trailer. So somehow, I think you, you start to understand, I argue that every choice designers make to solve architectural questions in a project have an effect not only when realized on construction site, but also on the site of extraction and of production. To illustrate these positions, here is a research drawing that's part of this ongoing research project I mentioned earlier. It's a drawing called Scales of Extraction, and it's an attempt to trace how these kind of designers choices of particular materialities will have repercussions elsewhere by pulling the material thread of that building. In doing so, one can visualize how design choices are grounded in extraction of raw materials and by expansion in exploitative processes that impact labor, soil, topography, air and water, non-humans, and so on. So it's a kind of critical mapping that attempts to think analytically the built environment. In that case, it's a house. And what's actually an interpretation of an existing drawing that some of you might know, it's an exploded axonometric view called Parts, produced by the Californian office Morphosis in the early 80s. It's a very precise inventory of each element used in the construction details of that, ho of that house. And somehow I use that as the initial step to pull up that virtual research thread. So in a way, trying to identify how each of these objects have a corresponding commodity and understand the, their extractive processes. So it's perhaps a little naive and simplified as a kind of listing of these materials, but it is this attempt to mirror these extractive economies. So to sum up from the window frames of the house to the concrete pillar of a highway bridge or from the wood flooring of a living room to the asphalt of our streets and from the steel bolts of a door to the three species of a park, the choices deployed in the materiality of the built environment have a global knock-on effect. Space-making processes require in their materialization numerous mineral resources acquired via extraction and the relocation of the earth resources, limestone, clay, iron ore, aluminum, diatomite, and so on as well as processed minerals in the form of aggregates, crushed stone, sand, gravel, cement, primary commodities correlated to labor, finance, energy, and ecology. So the present modus operandi of global construction protocols today and the most prevalent materials deployed in the production of space at this moment in time, and while there's a lot of very promising material, those are still rather anecdotal at that point, what is concrete, wood, steel, brick, glass, and petroleum-based materials as mostly used. One also has to take into account the hidden embodied carbon footprint related to the processing and transportation of each material into its final product, plus the labor necessary to make all of it happen externalities that we as architects or the industry or engineers and sometimes even historians ignore and ignoring basically pollution carbon footprints, the health of workers, consumers, and of those displaced by large-scale industrial development. And I argue that designers have to be fully aware of these links between space production and extractivism in order to challenge them. We know we have to problematize the role of materials in architecture and in design, which in orange is the constant increase of consumption of construction materials in the past decades, picking up after the 2008 crisis. And this is a 2017 survey, which I can guarantee you not going down in Germany alone, this is prevalent across the industrial as well. The construction of buildings caused some 40% of CO2 emission, 52% of our waste production, and consumes 90% of mineral non-renewable raw materials. So I just want to show you a small example. We were invited to contribute to the Seoul Biennale curated by Dominique Perrault on risk, and we propose an installation called Scales of Extraction, politicizing construction materials, four of the most banal construction materials used in the industry, wood, brick, steel, and concrete, were sourced on the local market and assembled. The form is very uh, kind of banal. It's generated as to ensure that the materials can be disassembled and reused by Habitat for Humanity Korea, who acted as a shadow client for this work. I can guarantee you that there was actually no uh, help from the side of the organization of the Biennale. I think it, its volume, or let's say that these difficulties encountered to secure the reuse of these materials somehow exposed, I think, the struggles of the industry to reinvent itself. And somehow with this project, we try to contribute to the rising call for urgent change by pointing at the responsibilities architecture
and planning disciplines bear in the destructive processes of construction today. So what we showed on this work was four research videos that were corresponding to the materials that are used in a way we're, we're uncovering how these ordinary materials were grounded in extractive processes and how in turn politics and territoriality of resource extraction are materialized in the built environment. I'm going to show you a few of this, a few minutes. As I mentioned, you, you saw this class I was started with material world. So the films were preceded where it came out of this class and we attempt to show some of these links tracing this kind of embryonic political economy of these materials that we use so carelessly in our designs. And in this work, the goal is to make visible and bring closer to hand the physical landscapes literally contained within our built environments and in doing so critically interrogate the ecological and social impacts of its political economy. Um, I'm going to show you a few minutes of this one. Law of conservation of mass, which states that total mass remains constant over time, it follows that concrete's heavy mass came from somewhere. From where was all of this mass displaced? The input mass that goes into concrete comes from mountains, hills, rivers, and dunes, topographically varied natural landscapes. By co-opting and displacing these components of concrete's heavy mass, this topography is lost and reduced to flat architectural components such as foundations and floors. Concrete sublimates topography into flatness. So what do we know of this topography of concrete? Sand for the Burj Khalifa was ironically not sourced from the desert that surrounds it. Instead, the UAE imported all sand for concrete and construction from Australia. Sabelco Corporation is currently facing two charges of breaching environmental planning laws during its time in charge of mining on the island but the unlawful sales have been going on for decades. The volume being extracted has also had a disproportionate impact on the Kwandimuka Aboriginal tribe, who call North Stradbroke Island their home. It's extremely important and sacred to the Kwandimuka people. We're Kwandimuka, Moreton Bay, and Yulaburabi, which is we are people of the sand and the sea. Another work was tracing the iron ore from mine to building, focusing on extremely long train lines constructed for the explicit purpose of carrying iron ore from deep inland mines to port cities to better understand the material in its limbo state as, I quote, matter not yet defined by the imperative of use in the kind of elongated process of transformation from mine to port, arguing that even before the iron ore becomes a commodity, uh, steel, it can still be social, politically, economically, and spatially impactful. The mess of metal particles mixed with clay binder before it was formed into a pellet ball. No longer raw planetary substance and not quite yet commodity, an in-between material, matter not yet defined by the imperative of use. What is steel before it becomes steel? Between sites of extraction and sites of use, what intermediary stages does the material undergo? We follow steel on its journey across landscapes and alongside people, as it changes hands, transforms in materiality and value, and takes form as the built environment. Since its construction in the 60s, the Mauritania Railway has acted as a massive conveyor belt, shuttling about 17 million tons of iron ore per year. The train tracks span Mauritania, from the mines deep in the Saharan desert, traveling southwest to Noadibu on the Atlantic coast. This arid landscape is inhospitable, but houses extensive deposits of iron ore. Thousands of laborers rely on the iron mining industry for their living wages, and iron ore accounts for 50% of Mauritania's exports. At 11 a.m. each morning, the train materializes seemingly from nowhere, kicking up a dust storm after its 17-hour rumble through the Sahara at a top speed of 50 kilometers an hour. People drive right up to the train, load their domestic livelihoods, beat packages of cement, mattresses and pillows, or goats and livestock. The train not only transports iron ore, but also provides a means of access for people who need to travel between towns in the desert and the more populated coastal cities. Described as the toughest ride in the world, the train has no passenger seats, 
but instead offers carts either full of freshly mined iron or empty ones that have just unloaded their cargo. Trains traveling in the direction of the mines are appended with water tankers, which transport water to cities that would otherwise have no source of water. Nuadibu, the end of the train line, processes iron as well as raw pellets. These get shipped out of port to Asia, Europe, and the Arab Peninsula for further processing into steel. While in transit, the iron ore remains in limbo. Matter out of place, not yet commodity, but not raw material either. Intense heat is used to purify iron ore into steel, a highly dangerous process that requires careful monitoring. This marks a turning point in the tale where iron transforms from commodity into product. We leave the Saharan train behind for a very different kind of train. A single car riding up the vertical tracks of one World Trade Center. It doesn't carry iron ore, but it does carry people, albeit in a very different landscape under very different circumstances. So I, I stop here and perhaps explain that with this work, we were trying to bridge this distance between sites of extraction, production and consumption, as well as design to materials. And somehow I think that these projects show that. I just want to point at a small piece that I, where I try to articulate some of this contribution. It's called The Devil is in the Detail. It's looking a little bit closely at aluminum, but with the same logic of understanding how the decisions that we take as designers are grounded into these exploitative processes, the transformation of nature into our built environment. I want to move into one of these projects that I think is also part of this strategic practice of urban design and that I, of course, that comes logically out of this, out of this research. If you remember, and of course you do, in March 2020, the world stopped and stood still. But not everything stopped. Construction materials, for instance, largely kept operating with some adjustments here and there. The first lesson the coronavirus has taught us is also the most astounding. We have actually proven that it is possible in a few weeks to put an economic system on hold everywhere in the world. And at the same time, a system that we're told was impossible to slow down or redirect. This is a quote from a text published in March 2020 amidst the global lockdown by French philosopher Bruno Latour. He calls for a reset, arguing that if everything is stopped, everything can be questioned, bent, selected, sorted, interrupted for good. Um, there is some myopia to this call, of course, because not everything stopped, not just construction, but of course, Uberized laborers or so-called frontline workers didn't stop working and of course the construction site also didn't stop somehow that pause that was offered to the industry was not taken upon in a way and the critical questions about the built environment remain unaddressed it's actually worse because post-covid new policies are being put in place that stimulate an increased demand for mineral for building infrastructure even called green infrastructure and i quote construction sites are some of the few areas of the economy that have remained open covid is already ushering in a new era of policies that will likely create cyclically stronger, more commodity-intensive economic growth. Again, we know that every material artifact and object the building as space is grounded in these extractive origins and to each corresponds a physical contemporary condition here, which is sapphire extraction used in our computer lenses. So ignoring the past, present, and the ongoing weaponization of extraction, we immerse in narratives of technological innovation and feel absolved from addressing our own responsibilities for the cost across corporeal and planetary bodies. Catherine Youssef speaks of nothing else when she talks about extractive economies and material geophysics of race and white geology in relation to power. In her book, A Billion Black Anthropocene or None, Youssef defines white geology as the way in which mineral nomenclatures used in traditional geology are devoid of references to racial and colonial histories of material power. But capital accumulation and the corresponding brutal processes at work in this direct or indirect transfer of raw materials to the built environment have long been perceived as detached from design discipline. While claiming an objective approach, education, practice, and technology in architecture disengage from political commitments and turn a blind eye to the very source of materialization. The truth is the claim neutrality of design and of design tools and the underlying assumption that technology and design is removed from politics, an inkling that prevails across architecture departments and practices, is simply no longer tenable. 
Stop Building, a global moratorium on new construction is an initiative that emerged from this situation, from this calls to stop and think remaining unheard. Its first steps take the form or took the form of roundtables from which I'm drawing today. So if the moratorium is first a perceived as a provocation to think it is also a very serious call to act upon the reality of extractivist practices on which we rely what Françoise Vergès calls extraction and exhaustion, not as a byproduct of capitalist accumulation, but in fact as capitalism's modus operandi. The racial, social, and environmental damage that comes intrinsically with using resources means that building is a choice of destruction. Building moratoriums have been used globally to halt the construction of projects or of several projects, or also as demanded to stop controversial developments. Building moratoriums are usually imposed by cities, local governments, and national courts, and for a variety of reasons. Moratoriums can be short-term or indefinite, depending on the project and the area. And as you see here in this carousel, precedent include the Costa Brava, the Baleares, the US, or Singapore. Now, the limits of the degrowth narratives are well understood by now, and we know that green capitalism has entirely voided the idea of sustainability and that pro problematic CO2 reduction policies also have become the stuff of riots. So who is to say build or not build? Why and for whom is build ongoing? So this question about spatial geographic inequalities revolving around construction are essential tangible issue. It is difficult to probe the narrative of housing needs when home insecurity is such a real and acute suffering for many. And it's also painful to interrogate the construction of infrastructures when not all countries are equally equipped. Precisely because not all countries are equally equipped in terms of housing and infrastructure with perhaps overbuilding on one side and lack of housing on the other, one could assume that a new construction moratorium should be limited to extractive nations with a consolidated building stock, basically dividing nations along GDP lines, and a moratorium could thus be dismissed as prejudice. Yet there, we need to look closely. As shown by researcher Omar Nagati and Bess Stryker in Cairo, there are 12 million vacant units. Of course, these high vacancy rates are grounded in locally specific conditions, such as rent control laws, proactive suburban development state programs, and a lack of trust in banking institutions, which means people buy apartments as securities and don't occupy them, for instance. Yet somehow these numbers complicate the equation and show the need and the urgency to assess our existing housing stock everywhere. Halting construction, even if temporarily, shall suspend the race for discounted materials while questioning the narrative of progress and of techno-positivism established around our capitalist societies. Building without an end in sight is the dictate and the jurisdiction of modernity. And we must precisely question the growth imperative of the construction industry. Here, the example of Tokyo studied by our colleague Noboro Kawagishi. Now, what in pink is office space construction, which is then exponential, even though the needs are shrinking, the kind of green lines with the home office practices and vacancy rates increasing. A moratorium would allow to seek alternative to real estate as the sole relentless economic motor, as well as inspect what the reevaluation of what not construction could bring. Now, obviously, it's not up to polluting privileged countries to ignore contextual complexities and call for blanket policy. Discussing the moratorium, South African architect Ilse Wolf showed that image of a self-initiated construction, a woman building a matcha who's a mat house, which is the traditional house of the Nama people in South Africa, as a way to interrogate the validity of a global call. In some places, while housing is in high demand for marginalized communities and the existing stock beyond repair, the state has fully disengaged from its mandate of providing affordable housing, leaving this task to the private market. In other places, thousands of square meters of office space stand vacant where young generations struggle to find affordable housing. Yet politicians from all sides claim building more units is the solution, storylines one should question. Contextual complexities call for a deeper onlook on where and what is constructed and what should not be built. So while addressing moral issues that surround the sustainability narrative, the posit is that while the modern project and its adjacent technocratic mindset must be held accountable for the current and ongoing disaster, the most urgent need is for structural change within the industry. A large majority of practices are also patriarchal, hierarchical, exploitative structures based on single authorship, mostly unable to address the climate emergency because of their obsolete functioning. 
Under the building moratorium, the architecture practice will materialize as a continuous labor of care and the definition of a work of architecture expanded beyond the momentary. Design offices are to pivot toward resource stewardship, to deploy organizing abilities to think about emancipated practice, not building less, building with what exists, caring for it. The reconsideration of the existing regime of construction obliged to reflect on the redistribution of ownership and control over spatial claims. To overturn the extractivism fundamental goes precisely against what Jason Moore has articulated as cheap nature. So somehow the most sustainable act is to keep what is there, to leave matter unextracted, oil in the ground, laterite under the tropical forest of Guinea, coal under the countryside, and so on. Now, this is not to say that nothing is to be done. As we stop and think about what is really necessary, we must interrogate the constant imperative of growth that sell, I quote here, and seeing a better life for all humanity, a mentality that continues to structure global asymmetries, materialized with the new construction of infrastructure and new city. And here, just as an example, a contribution to a competition for an affordable World Trade Center 5 in New York project entitled I Prefer Not To, which advocated for the budget allocated for this skyscraper to be used to purchase existing luxury housing and turn it into affordable housing. There is also Place Léon Occupé, a project that won a competition to build something by proposing not to build, but instead to intensify the maintenance protocols of the existing square instead of demolishing and building new, somehow also as a statement of how powerful the absence of building, if attached to spatial care, can be, allowing for design to be answering beyond construction and also articulating a critique of the archetypal assumption that architects must build new. I come to the conclusion to stop destroying our resources, the disempowering current economic model of development needs to be put in question. If new construction stops, even for a short while, not only the current build stock shall be revalued, buildings, infrastructure, materials, but also the values of its supporting care labor and of those who carry it. An entirely new way of designing and perceiving the world emerges, one that demands a careful assessment of present and vacant inventory, a new set of values, strong anti-demolition and preservation policies, occupancy and ownership models, densification plans and maintenance strategies, upgrading tactics, and alternative economic system to be imagined, formulated, planned, implemented toward a new built and unbuilt environment. So if at first glance thought-provoking and inflammatory, the moratorium aims to initiate a conversation on common priorities grounded in a global mandate reacting to local context via architectural measures, design, and policies. Rather than seeking to establish a universalist agenda, a global moratorium on new construction shall operate as a radical thinking framework to work out alternatives. I quote Nubian architect Mina Aga, as she said, not building to start constructing as a way to address the needs of social urgency and the reconstruction of communities, the rehabilitation of the racialized gendered population that bears the brunt of ecological destruction while being the very people engaged in reproductive and domestic labor. Imagining a world in which demolition, in where demolition and extraction are heresy, where soil is a precious matter and composting is a sacred task, a world in which decentered, degendered, depatriarchalized, and decolonized reproductive work is shared by humans and non humans alike, a world where repair labor is the most valuable of all works a world where construction is about the precise management of resources and architecture is the careful design of the reallocation of reclaimed materials and of pre-existing structures. A world in which technology is a caring friend and not an enemy. A world in which such an approach with its roots in circular economy, anti-extractivism and black and eco-feminism is no longer marginal, but is the mainstream modus operandi. The widespread common and banal reality to live in non-extractive societies, a life worth living for. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I was, I'm just taking a minute to take it all in. I think this was super relevant after our conversation with Ember Benali yesterday, who was talking about the extraction of uranium and of Black Mesa on people's lands in Navajo Nation and outlined all the policies in so by the US government that basically pushed them to take those resources. I'm gonna open up the floor for questions.
Yeah, just a couple of small informational questions uh, on the Egypts. Was there, in fact, a prohibition on building an agricultural land in, in and around Cairo at the time all of that construction was taking place? You said something about that the building of on agricultural land was illegal? Yes. So it's actually, it's very interesting. It's not that there is no um, legal framework about the fact that it's just illegal. It's that there is something like, I don't know, 70 laws that prohibit the construction on the grain land, which means that there is actually no way to make that legal, which means that actually everybody just does it illegally. It's of course related to the fact that there is no access to the formal housing stock for an immense majority of the population who don't even have bank accounts and things like that. So there is there is the need for housing and people cannot find housing anywhere else. So they just have started to build over agrarian land in the 70s when the city started to grow with rural migration and the construction of, um, actually the construction of administrative Cairo and modern Egypt in a way. It means that for instance, the current government has expressed desires to partially legalize some of this, but also partially demolish. So it's a very kind of precarious situation. People would have tenure titles that say they have one twenty-fourth of a plot of land, but it doesn't say anything about owning like a flat or something like that. I'm not sure I answered your question. No. Okay, so that's helpful. And part two of the question, the land use pattern of the agricultural land before it was developed had those longitudinal plots. Mm -hmm. Were those longitudinal plots actually a property ownership structure or were they an irrigation canal structure or a little bit of both? And the question, the reason I'm asking, those seem to drive the form of the development. Is that correct? Yeah, of course. So the ownership is, so there is a long history of land reforms in Egypt. So in the 50s, when the Nasser regime took over from the, let's say, leftover of the colonial regime, where the British had the uh, King Farouk in place, he basically initiated a first wave of land reform, which were aimed at basically eliminating the elite ruling class. So it's first and foremost, a political gesture rather than a kind of actual land reform, the idea is like to limit the size of ownership. So there was a first wave of limitation of ownership. And then the land that was taken from uh, large estate owners where was redistributed among landless farmers. So you have a kind of shift of ownership. People got very small plots of land. So there's a very kind of, there's a kind of splintering of ownership. There were three waves of land reform. So there's a second reform, I think around the mid sixties where again, the size, maximum size of estate ownership is reduced. So again, large farmers, large estate owners have to surrender parts of their estates to others. And then there's the last one in the 70, in 1970 with a kind of, again, a lowering of the size of the estates. And then, so you have a mix of like large estate owners who would have tenants who would basically lease the land. These tenants benefited also from Nasser reform of a blocked rent price. So the land would be rent and could not evict the farmers. You had to, the lease was automatically re renewed and you could not, you could not raise the price and you would, people were allowed to pass on the lease from, to their children. So you have a kind of de facto ownership under a kind of tenant system. This all comes to an end when Mubarak take power in the 90s. He integrates, he brings with the IMF reforms. He basically suspends the land reform, the protection for tenants. So it means it's now allowed to sell and to, to basically evict your tenants. And this marks the beginning of the end for this particular agriculture estates around Cairo in particular, because it's so close to the city that it becomes very desirable places to to live then the fact that the land becomes incredibly mm, not productive anymore because of the adjacency to the city is also something that means that the the kind of the farmers would not be able to actually they switch from human consumption crops to uh, and things for animals for instance when you have your plots around the city because it's not so long for the myth of urban farming by the way so this is the situation now the relation between the form end of the city and the ownership scheme i think is very clear it's just you have this longitudinal fedan which are basically irrigation based so it's based on irrigation but then people would subdivide it and then you have these plots which are basically mirroring almost the, the former agricultural practices and are those buildings now uh, the occupied buildings are they on the tax roll no there's no tax 
That's that, because they're not registered. So the people don't pay taxes here. That's one of the things, that's the Her- Hernando de Soto proposal who considered these areas as untapped capital and advocates actually the, for the city to, or for the country, or the, let's say the government to recognize those and start taxing them, which is cynical, of course, because they have very they have no benefits from the state. There is no school. There is no... People have to install themselves their water pipes and things like that. So it's, it's actually more expensive to live in these areas than it is to live in formal neighborhoods because you have to actually come up with the infrastructure yourself. So for instance, uh, there's an interesting story. This area that I was showing before is next to a highway, to the ring road, which goes around Cairo. And during the revolution, so there was a kind of vacuum of power, right? There is this in-between moment where no one's really in charge. So they rent a caterpillar and they make themselves an exit, a highway exit to the ring road, which was not the case before. It was just a cut. And so they did that. The community got together and did that. And then they were very smart. They made a opening ceremony. They invited the local governor to cut the ribbon and open the, the kind of new infrastructure that they had built for themselves. But it also speaks of the fact that while communities can do that, they cannot build their own hospitals. They cannot have their own kind of water infrastructure and things like that. It's a very unjust form of urbanization, I think, that you see here. Even though if it works in a lot of ways, the fact that they would not, that they're not taxed is very correct, I think. And until the government would actually come up with the right infrastructures, then they shouldn't be taxed. They vote, though. So when it's election time, you have it's full of posters and People distribute free stuff and stuff like that. So there is a kind of activity at that level, of course, but still no no infrastructure inside. And are they on the grid in any way? Do they have electricity? Do they have sewer? They have electricity. People, so for instance, the electricity company is non-biased and would be happy to install a kind of, a, how you say, a counter and would charge you for it. They would charge you for installing it. They would charge you for the, your consumption so people have electricity like they have state electricity there's no water though the water system is so either you have tanks and there is a, a a truck that comes and you know put the water it's very expensive and then some of them some the ones that are closest to the city they've managed to connect to the local to the state system the water system also they've connected themselves to the sewage system but the ones that are more remote they don't have this kind of facility so they have tanks the tanks are very often not, not well built, so they would seep and they would start to damage the foundation of the buildings. It's not, you can, you, you, we promise you a city, but then you, you will only get a house. Uh, I think you identified a fear to reconstruction. And I think, so you identified a very clear and compelling argument and ways to leave the construction extraction, extractive industry behind. But I'm wondering if the exhibition in Cairo uh, what are the sort of tangencies where the conversation is able to leave academic spaces and insert itself more so in the real world with impact? So if you have any example, other examples. Of- yes, for instance, there's also work that we did in Marseille, which happens to be my hometown, which was about build two buildings that collapsed in the city center and there were eight people died. And we were anyway working on Marseille. So we were looking into that and thinking about ways to contribute to the conversation. At the time, there was an electoral battle, the conservative municipality, which was actually responsible for not maintaining these buildings, was being challenged by another municipality. So for instance, we did a little exhibition in the middle of the city in partnership with a local group of uh, residents that were actually pushing, for instance, for alternative form of ownerships. We were looking at cooperatives as an example of how we could deal with this kind of dilapidated building. We looked at like several legal frameworks and also, of course, design and architectural proposals. And we exhibited that. We invited many local residents. And in a way, I think that was another form of contribution to the local discussion in the local context with the idea that, again, this, this kind of planning and planning matters are public matters that these are not to be gate kept that those are part of a conversation that should be happening among citizens and that shouldn't be shouldn't be left to experts because anyway we should be suspicious of that expertise as a kind of also problematic gatekeeping 
tactic. And and then we were very happy because the municipality, the conservative municipality lost. We're not claiming credit for that. That would be preposterous. But at the same time, I think that there was a conversation, ongoing conversation, and we just participated in that conversation. I could feel comfortable doing that because I'm from there. I think in the case of Cairo, we had local partners. We've been there for five years. There was a kind of a long-term relationship. It was really not a kind of like touch base, touch, touch and go thing. We were like, we're very involved in the local context and our local partners were like totally on board and they really wanted that. And just saying that it was not about like going there and being like, hey, here's a show and you guys should talk about this stuff and buy, but like kind of part of a long-term partnership and a kind of, let's say, rather in-depth understanding of the kind of context also, which I think matters. Does anyone have any any questions? Thank you, Charlotte. I wanted to, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, fantastic. Go ahead. I was really struck by the graphic of all those sort of interdisciplinary roles that you showed. And I'm, yeah, I thought that was really poignant. And I think there are a lot of people who are really questioning their fields and are trying to push into more interdisciplinary spaces. And I was really struck by this sort of duality of starting from this space of emergency and going, landing us into a space of emergence. And I'm really curious if you see at all those interdisciplinary modes of thinking about these different disciplines materializing in a way and what can be done to encourage that development across fields. Yeah, thanks for your question and, and for your on this work. I think for me, I would just say, for instance, like the, the last part that you saw with this kind of, let's say the comic, the graphic novel somehow output. So that was, and in a way that also relates a little bit to Margot's question before is how much, and I guess also at scratching experts, how much of what we do is relevant if it's not understood by others. So for instance, the comic, the graphic novel is something that I find really enriching as an interdisciplinary mode of communicating ideas so I guess it's not even just about the discipline but the kind of also the modes that one decides is useful to to ex explore a topic it's for instance something that I initiated with a work on Ellen Gray so there's a comic book that I wrote and that that partner Zosia Dzerzyska she uh she did the illustration and we worked together on that which was basically a kind of militant act of putting the life of a female queer designer out there for everyone to read because you would be surprised but people actually read comic book I always joke that this is the one that this is the stuff I wrote that um had was read by the most people <laughs> because it's and it's amazing people actually read it and then people who are have nothing to do with architecture or planning or whatever are just like interested it's not a biopic it's more like a it's it's really about the house and the house of in gray and all that but and when we did that comic somehow it emerged that this is a really accessible form of expressing questions or articulating work somehow so we decided to continue with that work and the, the work that you saw the blue one is for architectural review it's about an architecture without extraction and it is also trying to express in a graphical way these ideas of how can we change the way that we deal with the built environment and, and all that and it also borrows extensively from a field of thinkers that are not architects it's obviously donna harway or audrey lord and or other other fields or even instagram account for what it matters it's really an aggregation of topics which i think is incredibly beneficial i'm not sure how in in if you were looking at the way that architecture for instance is practiced there is a lot of interdiscipline but of course the way that it's being ex press is still very coded. I think that there's only benefits to moving between disciplines. It can be tricky at times if you're like in institutions because institutions don't really, even though they say they want to be interdisciplinary or transinstitutional, for instance, you need a third book to be considered tenured material. Just be open about this question. So there is a difficulty to navigate the, let's say, the optics of institutions which want trans transdisciplinarity, which wants co collaborations, but then don't value that when it comes to Excel sheets. I can also give you as an example, these works that we did the research videos, for instance, which are basically for me, they have the same value than a paper 
but there is no process. Like at the end of the year, the institution sends an email that says, please submit your best papers. And we're like, can we submit the videos or? So the formats are also, that's a very interdisciplinary format. For instance, Material World, we taught with a filmmaker. I don't know how to do films. I was not going to teach people how to do films. So I had just asked somebody who, it's also about asking for help, which is also something against expertise. It's, I can't, I'm not going to teach you how to make movies because I don't know how to do that. And maybe there are people who can help. So we invited somebody to help us make movies. So now I know how to make movies. And the students make yeah. made wonderful movies as well. But then the institution, while it celebrates that, was not able to recognize it in its own format. So there's also this kind of inertia or like, let's say, rigidity in certain systems to recognize the value of these kind of transdisciplinary inter, inter kind of like, or like multi-format outputs that the that you want to explore with. I cannot submit the graphic novel for my tenure file. Maybe I should, but I still like it. And it's, it is still doing a wonderful and it has its own life. It's been translated in Spanish and French and Polish. So it has its own life. So it's all good. So yeah, I think it's, it's wonderful. Also, it's fun to work with like other disciplines and explore. So I would definitely advocate for more of it. Thank you for all your questions and listening. And uh, yeah, I think you're still in for a few more treats of lectures and talks. So I, I hope that's going to be, that's going to be great. Mm -hmm.